So I'm also going to talk about lens sizing uh, using ultrasound, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the use of high frequency ultrasound. Uh, my financial disclosure is that yes, of course, I'm uh, I developed an ultrasound scanner, as many of you know, and this was me in 1996 on the floor there at Cornell University, and that's Ron Silverman. Um, and so we have um, we have a financial interest in, in in this device. The risks of ICL surgery and the complications are by and large to do with the sizing of the of, of, of the lens itself. So I'd like to take us through the history of sizing, uh, because in the late 90s, uh, when Carlo Vizzolo was one of the first people to be um, aggressively using this technology here in Europe and wrote a textbook, 200, 300 page textbook published in 1999 on the ICL, um, sizing was still a very primitive uh, uh, equation, and it was essentially white to white plus 0.5 millimeters. And that, let's call that version one. The Ocos website, the star sizing formulation, actually now includes a multivariate elements, as far as I understand. Um, in other words, the refraction, which of course relates to what lens, what lens power is being used, is included. The keratometry seems to be a factor that predicts uh, volt, and the ACD predicts volt. Um, and you know, it's all about this correlation, right? This white to white versus you know the posterior chamber dimensions which is where the lens is actually going to go and so because of the correlation coefficient being low we published a paper clinically here with the artemis one in london and you can see that the coefficient is 0.32 it's just a very low correlation so yes there is a correlation but there are a lot of outliers from the expected correlation line and all of the UBM studies, which of course lower resolution, lower repeatability, um, it still came to this conclusion, and it led to you know sul sulcus to sulcus sizing. And Lovizolo had been doing this in the late 90s already. Doherty, of course, published the paper from his FDA data, which the U.S. has been uh, using uh, diligently. His lookup table, of course, includes the ICL power, which tells you about the mechanics of the lens, the bendability of the lens. The, you know, the higher power ones are thinner in the center, so they bend more. Um, but then, you know, Kojima came to us uh, with, you know, a brilliant, you know, everything that's obvious is, is obviously brilliant because no one else thought about it. But obviously, the reason why the Kojima formula is better than the Doherty is that the lens rise subtracts volt from the same sulcus position. And so uh, Takashi very cleverly introduced this and did some beautiful uh, multivariate regression analysis for us and provided us with this formula, which I called version 2.5. And we were going to use Kojima's equation because it's you know, technically the most sophisticated equation out there. And we've expected to get better results than than Takashi himself, because he was using a handheld ultrasound and we were using a high-tech robotic scanner. When we look at the outliers, we know now that the sulcus and the angle can be the same size in some eyes. The sulcus can be larger than the angle in some eyes. The angle can be larger than the sulcus in most eyes, but there can be different sulcus anatomy and not just within patients, but between the eyes of the same patient. Here's a patient with, with sulcus, some kind of sulcus recession anatomy on one side, but not the other. And so the very anatomy of the sulcus is important to understand. And finally, iris cysts. Iris cysts are very, very common. In fact, they're way more common than you think. Now that we scan, of course, everyone pre-op, we're finding these everywhere. So how did we approach this? Well, we took the, you know, the whiteboard approach and we took the, all of the measurements we could conceive that might be of, of use, the anterior chamber depth, the angle of the angle, uh, the angle to angle distance, the sulcus to sulcus distance, the sulcus to sulcus lens rise, the zonule to zonule distance, the zonule to zonule lens rise, and the ciliary body inner diameter as I called it. I mean, in fact, that was the last one we put in. I said, I, I don't think it's going to be of any interest because ciliary processes, they, they kind of float around. So when you scan, you might be scanning in the plane of a ciliary process or not. And I thought that probably isn't a valuable number, but let's just stick it in. 
Of course, we always have the non-anatomical parameters there. They're, they've always been there, the white to white, the ICL power of the lens we're implanting, um, and the scotopic pupil, which had already been shown to change the volt postoperatively. You know, the lights are on, the volt goes down. What we found was, again, a regression analysis, multivariate stepwise regression analysis, and our significant factors were ciliary body inner diameter, sulcus to sulcus lens rise, scotopic pupil. And what was fascinating was that we, no matter what we did, we could not get the sulcus to sulcus to be in the equation at the same time as the ciliary body inner diameter. We used nonlinear regression analysis and we tried to get it in somehow, but we couldn't. And so what this told us was that the ciliary body inner diameter is such a strong predictor of the volt of the lens that you don't need the sulcus to sulcus anymore. And it turns out the sulcus to sulcus itself was only a correlate to what this volt was gonna be. So our formula, if you don't mind us you know, boldly calling it version 3.0, includes three terms that were never described before. And rather than recommending a lens size, what we did was we said, no, forget about that. Let's use these parameters and let's give what the volt would be for each of the four available sizes. You might want to select a higher or a lower volt depending on the eye. We programmed everyone's equations. This is the Nakamura 2 and Doherty, the Kojima, and our own equation here. And all you have to, whatever, it's like the ASCRS website, it's free, free of charge to use. There's no, there's no, um, it's, it, 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 there it is. Um, if you enter all of the parameters, then you'll get all of the equations and you can compare the results. But if you enter only uh, the parameters you know, relating to ours, then you'll only get our, 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 our. So depending on what you enter is what, is what you get out of it. So the way we used and, and produced this was as follows. We, like I said, we used a training set, if you like, which was using the Kojima formula and using those 42 eyes implanted by Kojima directive, we then did a multivariate regression analysis and came up with a formula version one that was on 30. And then we applied that formula to 36 eyes prospectively. And then we did more eyes. And by the time we got to the end of those eyes, we pooled all of the eyes together and did another uh, um, calibration, if you like, of the coefficients. And so here is the training set. Uh, here's the uh, interquartile range um, with the training set using the Kojima formula and the Insight 100. Here was formula one and the interquartile range, and here's formula two. Now, for the sake of, of, of ease in, our, in the paper, which we've just submitted, we just combined formula one and formula two to give us the bigger numbers, even though it makes the results slightly less good than formula two alone. But here's the pooled results of our formula using the Insight 100. And what we then did was to back calculate, based on our model, what the volt would have been if we had used the lens suggested by any of the other formulas. Obviously, if it's the same lens as the one that we suggested, then that would have been the volt. And if it was a larger lens, it would have gone up by whatever our equation would have predicted that volt to be different. So this is a model, okay? But it does show you that by and large, uh, the star, which I think everybody knows this by intuition, the star formula tends to be a little bit high, and a lot of people subtract one size, usually often from, from, from what they see on the Ocos website. Um, but, you know, the Iragashi, the NK2, just a little bit higher, you know, than, 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 the, than the ultrasound Kojima formula that we got. Um, and so this is just an overall picture, okay? But let's look at the interquartile ranges, because that's kind of like an, a, 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 a measure of dispersion, right? And you can see that the dispersion that we have, even combining formula one and formula two, is exceedingly low, and it's way lower than, than you know, anything we had before. And it's really the, it's the outliers that we're interested in getting rid of because the exchange rate of the ICL is very low, even with white to white sizing, it's very low. So what we're trying to do is to get rid of the outliers so that we can get rid of the exchanges. That's, that's the key here. 
So tightening the interquartile range, tightening the full range is what we're looking for. So we just looked at this um, you know, in, in another way. We said, well, based on the size that we chose, what were the other formulas uh, choosing? And, and you know, I'll just single out the, the OCOS, which is the, you know, obviously the oldest equation. 17% of the time, the OCOS website recommended a size that was two sizes larger than the London Vision Clinic uh, formula did. And you know, where does that apply? Well, let's show you an example. This is our Excel spreadsheet. We, I mean, we don't, we're not using our own website, we're, but we have the formulas obviously in-house. Um, and so for this case, we, we chose to use a 12.6 and target a volt of 568 and 547. Now, the star formula suggested a 13.7, but we put in a 12.6, that's two sizes under. Now, instead of getting 568, we got about, you know, uh, 800 and something, we got about 250 microns more in each eye than predicted. Okay, that's fine because we put in a 12.6. If we had put in the 13.7 and it had been 250 above 1,000, that might have put us into lens exchange territory, depending on the AC depth and the angle and all of that. So the point here is I'm saying again, is about eliminating the exchanges. It's, you know, the volt is exceedingly um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, forgiving, I think is the best word we can use. So if we look at the regression, uh, the, you know, and, and not many have plotted these graphs. Um, um, I know that Takashi can do that now, but, you know, we were the very first to do this. Uh, no one, everyone always talks about the volt being within reason, like between 250 and 1,000. But we're actually looking like refractive surgeons at attempted versus achieved. And you can see that our, we had a little bit of a, a, of a tilt in our Formula One, but actually with the more eyes, this now became a, a rather one-to-one -one correlation. Um, and here's the, uh, the analysis of within 100, within 200, and within 300. And I want to, I want to just point this out. So with, with direct measurements in the posterior chamber, from high frequency ultrasound robotic scanning, we're getting 61% of the eyes within 100 microns of intended volt. And remember, one hair is 100 microns. So 86% within 200 and almost all of the eyes within 300 microns of the intended volt. Now, compared to the others, you know, clearly this is you know, an order of magnitude kind of is, if you like, better. Um, let's look at the within 100, and obviously OCT is better, uh, and the Nakamura, the NK2, and, I, and, I'm, and the NK3, now I'm very excited about that, uh, better than, than the original STAR formulations. Um, STAR, really, if you're using the OCOS website only, you're now really behind because obviously OCT is better. Um, but high-frequency ultrasound direct measurements of where the lens is going to be placed is even better. And it goes without saying that the outcomes of, and this, you know, the safety and the efficacy of this technology is absolutely, you know, gobsmacking. Um, the accuracy in the, in the high myopic range, you know, maybe, you know, vertex distance allowing uh, for some errors, but it is just remarkable how accurate this technology is. It's as accurate as your refraction technique is. I really believe that the efforts being made uh, by um, Dr. Nakamura and Dr. Kojima, uh, our efforts, um, Alonzo, I mean, those, uh, you know, Saldivar, all of us around the world who are really fretting about sizing, uh, I, I think we're going to I think in the very near future, I think we're, we're already getting very close to perfection. Uh, perhaps we'll, we're, we're at the doorstep of perfection. Certainly our formula now, it's almost like you can choose the volt of the lens now uh, by using high frequency ultrasound. So thank you uh, very much for that, uh, for your attention on that.